Mr. Michael Murder was born in Gurlis, a town in the southern region of, of Poland, and was one of three brothers. Michael was 14 years old at the start of the war and survived nine concentration camps? Ten. Ten concentration camps. He's the lone survivor from his entire family. Please give your undivided attention to hear the extraordinary story from this warm and humorous family man who is proud of his Judaism. Do you want me to stand up? Good evening and shalom. My name is Michael Marder and I'm a Holocaust survivor. Was born in Goritz, Poland in 1925. But please don't let anyone know how old I am. <laughs> I'm going to stay young. Before I begin, I would like to express my thanks to Rabbi Levitin and Rebetzin and all of you who have extended the invitation to me. A few weeks ago was Yom HaShoah, the day of Holocaust Remembrance Day, which was established by the Israeli Knesset Parliament in 1951. Yom HaShoah is also observed throughout the United States and many European locations. Commemorative ceremonies are coordinated by Jewish religious and community centers. Gentile religious institutions, interfaith centers, and sectarian associations. Although there are no set rules for the observance of Yom HaShoah, the ceremonies typically include speakers, prayers, and candle lighting. It's come into light six candles to represent the six million Jews killed, although some ceremonies like the seventh candle to commemorate the non-Jewish victims of Nazi persecution. <clears throat> now I will, let, I will tell you a little bit about my religious upbringing in an Orthodox Jewish home. <coughs> I had a strange and long life. In the beginning, when I was at home, first with my parents, then with my grandparents, I was very happy. We were three children, all boys, and I was the middle child. Unfortunately, my father died when I was only five years old. Like the other children around, I attended public school because truthfully it was mandatory, not necessarily, because I liked it. it is, in this summer, I turned 10 years old. My older brother went with me to visit my grandfather for the summer. This was my father's father, and in the town he lived in was called Nisko, not Sanem. It was about 60 miles away which was many hours at that time. I liked it there, but my brother was homesick and he wanted to go back home to our mother. He went back, I stayed on with my grandparents and three aunts and two uncles who lived in a small house, but we considered it quite comfortable. Now let me tell you what's so special about my grandfather. My grandfather had a, very, had a very special place in my heart. To me, he was my father, teacher, and someone to look up to. Whenever he took an afternoon nap, I would polish his half boot, boots, spit and shine. Later in life, he was councilman at the city hall and held many positions in the public arena. 
As autumn approached, I was enrolled into public school where I was one of 105 students in a class. Every morning I got up at 6 a.m. and went to hippo classes for an hour and a half before going to regular school in town. I went to these classes every day, Monday through Friday, and in the winter I had to study by candlelight because we had, there were no electricity in the house. We had homework every day and even had class inspection daily, which included checking our ears and hands and nails just to make sure we were clean. If the homework was not brought to class, we received five lashes with a wooden ruler on the palm of your hands. I am sorry to say I suffered this punishment many, many times. <laughs> Public schools ended at 2 p.m. After school, when I got home, if it was in the summer, I would attend to my garden where I grew tomatoes, red radishes, cucumbers, parsley, dill, and a few other things. We had a well on the premises. I would lower a pail tied up on a rope, put it into the well, and pull up the water, cranking a handle, and then empty it into a different garden pail, then sprinkle the water over the vegetables in the garden. I did it three or four times a week, towards the evening, just before sunset. I also had a few chickens running around that would lay eggs. Each time a chicken laid an egg, and while it was still warm, I would rub my eyes with a warm egg. My grandfather had told me that if you took that warm egg as it comes out from the chicken tush and rub my eyes with the warm egg, I would see forever and ever. <laughs> I had several fruit trees on the premises cherry, plum, and apple. I loved to run around barefooted and climb the tallest tree. On Wednesday, it was market day when the farmers would bring their produce to town. I would go shopping with my grandfather and buy potatoes, cabbage, live chickens, etc. My next assignment was to bring in firewood for the oven to make it ready for Thursday night. This was a special night put aside for the baking, a special bread called challah, other breads and cookies for the week. Every woman in the house was busy until midnight and the aroma in the house was delighted. And then came September 1939. That was the time that Germany, without even declaring war on Poland, just marched into the country and broke the frontiers. They had already done the same thing in Czechoslovakia and Austria. It was clear that those were the tactics of the way Germany operated. I just got up one morning and all hell broke loose. Poland was occupied by the Nazis, and within three days, Poland just collapsed, and the country was in turmoil. People were running away from big cities and small cities. No one knew where to go to be safer. My grandfather rented, rented a horse and buggy, and we left for a small village, about one hour away. We abandoned our home and the belongings of a lifetime and left the house. Before we left, my grandfather took a huge earthware pot and gathered all the family around him. He told us what was in it. It was the family's heirlooms of silver and gold, including a partially handwritten manuscript he planned to publish in the future. He ran into the basement of the house and buried it, telling me that after the war we should return and retrieve it. He had done this during World War I, 1914, 1918, and we were sure we would return to reoccupy the house and retrieve our belongings. Alas, however, I did not go back to my home, although I did return 50 years later to find a parking lot in that place. Oh. What is that? Okay. About 
We stayed in the village at a farm for about two weeks and then the Germans arrived and we evacuated to another town. This town was called Ulanov. Why Ulanov? It was because it was the site of a small river which divided the territory from Russian forces and although there were no Russian soldiers yet, we were sure this was to be the frontier and felt the Germans would evacuate all the Jews to the other side of the river. About three days later, the Russian army marched into the town and we all rejoiced and we relieved of the fear of the Germans. Then, just a short time later, the Russian soldiers got orders to fall back and establish a new border about 60 miles east and left. You can imagine the cries and fears of all mothers, fathers, young women and children when they realized the town would be occupied by the Nazis. Many hundreds of young Jewish men and women began to run away from the path of the Germans and they went with the Russians. Two of my uncles rejoined the Russian retreat and to a town called Lvov. This town was occupied by the Russians and they hoped to be safe and then to be able to return and reunite with our family. One day the Russians told them all, all they could return to their families if they wished and my uncles were anxious to do so. The Russians told them to gather at the railroad station to return to us but instead they shipped them off to Siberia by the thousands to slave laborers. After the war, some acquaintances said they had seen my uncles in Siberia in a town called Archangelsk, but they did not come back, so we must believe they died of starvation and hard labor. It's a little too cold here. I'm shivering. Yeah. We're making it warmer, Mr. Mar. I agree. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now it's 1940. All of Poland was occupied by the Germans. There was looting, burning of properties, and especially books. And there was the secretion of synagogues. Beautiful buildings were demolished. Synagogues became stables for horses. Documents of marriages and birth certificates were destroyed. They rounded up young boys, of whom I was one, to dismantle the brick walls after they had burned down the synagogue in our town. And then had the pieces carted away to be used in other constructions. We were exhausted without pay or food. The only way my family had survived was because I had an aunt in Italy who would send us packages of used clothing. We exchanged and bartered the contents with local farmers for food to be able to survive. Once or twice a week, some friends and I would go into the forest to gather pine cones to be used for fuel. Often we were caught by the forest ranger who took the cones away and we had to return home empty-handed. I was crying because we had no fuel to cook, to cook with or anything to heat the house. By this time we had received word that my mother had been shot by the Gestapo, my hometown, the town where I was born. By midsummer June 1941, the Nazis needed a contingent of 100 men to be sent away to a labor camp. And the SS men were searching from house to house for young men. My bad luck was they caught me while I was chopping wood in the backyard, dra dragging me to the square where we were rounded up and awaited orders to be shipped out. Mothers parents, grandparents and children all gathered in the square to say goodbye. Most of everyone was crying, not knowing our fate. I can still see the, the cries of my grandmother and aunt sending their eyes swollen with tears. By 3 p.m. the transport was filled up and we went to, in three wagons to the unknown, to a faraway place. 
After three hours or so, we arrived at a camp called Yanishov. At the entrance of the camp, we were greeted by a short, stocky, fat Ukrainian who called himself the Commandant. He made a speech that we have come here to this camp to work and he told us not to get any ideas about running away. For each one that would try to escape, ten of us would be shot or hung on the gallows, which you can see right in front of your eyes. And then he pulled out one young man and shot him in cold blood. That scared the wits out of us because we had never ever witnessed cold-blooded murder. He then dismissed us to the barracks. The time was 7 p.m. Each barrack held about 300 to 350 persons. The bunks were three beds high. In the middle of the barrack was a huge round metal dish which was to be used for urination because we were not allowed to leave the barracks at night. And if we did and were caught, they would shoot on sight. At 5 a.m. the whistle blew. It was time to get up gather in the square of the camp for a count. Every morning this was the procedure and it went on for about one hour, rain or shine. After the count, each of us received one cup of coffee and a slice of dark bread. Some of us brought with them some provisions that the loved ones had packed for them for their unknown trip and destination. They were able to add these provisions to the meager diet that were given, but did not last for long, since frequently one stole a stale loaf from the other intern. After, after the small meal, we proceeded to a shack and we were given shovels. We then went five abreast, not knowing where we were going, but eventually we arrived at a place along the river Vistula where we dug lime and, hand, and hold it in wheelbarrows to build dikes to stop the overflow of the river which prevented the farmers from growing crop. The labor we did was hard. Many of the older inmates could not endure the constant work and beatings and they would collapse under the whip or daily would be shot. This went on for about five months, and finally, word went out to the partisan, you know what the partisan is, freedom fighters. And one night in October, the partisans broke into the camp, killed the commandant and his helpers, and told the inmates that you are free to go. The problem was where to go. We could not go back home because we have heard that women, men and children were taken to the cemetery where they had to dig their own grave oh, and were no. shot one by one. Okay? My, my father once did that to a guest, that's not some of the dead that had escaped into the forest sooner or later were caught by the Poles who handed them over to the Gestapo and as a reward they received a pittance for each escapee they turned in. The rest of us included me, stayed in the camp for a couple of days until the SS soldiers arrived in several huge trucks and put about 100 inmates into each truck, consequently beating them with the butt of the carbine and those left behind were shot. The camp was afterwards destroyed. About one hour after we entered the truck, we arrived at a camp called Budzen. In reality, we were supposed to have gone to Maidaner, which is a crematorium, but by sheer luck, we were turned away and instead went to Budzen, which was a huge camp consisting of several thousand inmates, some of whom came from as far away as Lodz, Warsaw, etc. The daily procedure was getting up at dawn or before, standing for our count and, and going to work information of five abreast, singing constantly. 
those who could not keep up with the march to work were shot and left in the gutter. My work was to repair aircraft wings that had been damaged by artillery. One day, though, I got very sick and had to go to the small infirmary in the camp. I was seen by a doctor and he diagnosed me as having scarlet fever. The hospital had a few beds and so I was admitted. The doctor took a liking to me and he said, Michael, when you get better, I would like to you to be the head nurse in the new hospital. Sure enough, I recovered, recuperated, and went to work at the head nurse. The hospital was full of sick people, about 300 of them. Every morning, I took the temperature. On one occasion, when I put the thermometer in one patient's mouth, he chewed it up with the mercury in it. Poor oh, guy. When the camp commandant made his alarms one morning, he walked between the beds and leaned over to speak to a patient whom I had included in the count of inmates and told them how many were present now and how many had died overnight. This day, before I had a chance to speak, he whipped me across the center of my head and my urine left my body and I dropped my feces. I lost my consciousness for a few seconds. He had stopped at one of the sick inmates and was asking, had he not seen this inmate yesterday? So I said, yes, and he's getting better and in a few days he will return to work. This commandant always had his vicious German shepherd dog with him, but this time it, was, it, it, it did not satisfy the commandant and he was so bloodthirsty. A stretcher was ordered and the inmate was put on it. In spite of his crying and asking, where are you taking me, where are you taking me, I was forced to follow them as they took him to the back of the barrack where there was a huge fire burning. The fire was needed because the straw, the straw that the inmates slept on were infested with lice, bed bugs and all kinds of vermin which was disposed in the fire. They were all carriers of disease. When we got to where the huge fire was burning, the commandant ordered the stretcher with the men on it, throw him into the fire. Then he ordered the soldier in the watchtower next to the electrified fence to come down and shoot the man who was already dead from the fire. Atrocities of this kind, shooting, hangings, were going on all the time. One night, an inmate ran away, and the soldiers went on a rampage and rounded up about 20 of us. I was one of them, saying, get on the ground with your hands behind your back, and we would be shot. Miraculously, after four hours or so, we were told to get up and go back to the barrack. Every minute, every hour of the day, I was fighting the angel of death. As the Russians were progressing toward Germany and getting closer to the camp, the Germans received orders to liquidate the camp and relocate the inmates. Thus, we were shipped out to a town called Radom. In Radom, I was working in an ammunition factory. After three months, again, the Germans had to evacuate and we were again given orders and marched to... We were with them. Again, the Germans had to evacuate and were given, uh, and were again rounded up and marched. Right. We were rounded up and marched to a death camp in ta to a town called Tamashov Mazowiecki, where we were supposed to be gassed to death. But then an order came, and we walked to the railroad station back. They packed us in the cattle car and shipped us out to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, a selection was made. Frail men and women and children were separated from us, and the rest of us were packed in cattle cars and sent to labor camp deep in Germany near Stuttgart. What happened to those left behind in Auschwitz, you all know too well their fate. It was the gas chambers in crematoria. In the Weihingen camp near Stuttgart, we worked at a quarry and mine, cutting up racks which were deep in the mine. The labor was very hard, 
and many times I thought of killing myself by jumping from the high ledge into the depth of the mine. But some inexplicable fate compelled me to keep on to work and to remain alive. On one occasion, when in while in Weihingen camp, a contingent of inmates, including me, were sent to Stuttgart to clear the streets of debris after the American and British airplanes had bombed the town. <coughs> While working, a few elders... <coughs> By working, a few elderly German women passed by and stopped to look at us, asked the SS guard, who are those people? The SS guard replied, these are Jews. The German women were astonished and bewildered and said, es gibt noch Juden, in other words, Jews still exist? And so the SS men said to us, you see, if not for me guarding you, they would have killed you. So after five months, this camp was liquidated as well because the American forces were moving from the south. From here, we were loaded into railroad cars and shipped out to famous death camp of Bergen-Belsen. Anybody knows what Bergen-Belsen is? Okay. Now. <clears throat> okay. Once there, my assignment was to gather dead bodies and hold them away in wheelbarrows to a huge pit where I was to dump them. I was here with a friend whose name is Aaron Fellenbaum, who now resides in Los Angeles. He's dead already. California, who got sick, and we had to get out of here. We had no food or water. Conditions in Bergen-Belsen were horrible. The camp was filthy and overcrowded. Ironically speaking, whatever bad it was in Auschwitz was worse in Bergen-Belsen, except that there were no gas chambers. Thousands of inmates were dying daily from starvation, torture, and all kinds of epidemic diseases. People were eating the insides of other people. It was clear we would not survive. So we decided to escape. Next to our barracks was a wire fence which was not electrified. <clears throat> At night we were able to sneak underneath and got, and got to the other side of the fence where political interns were housed. A political intern were those that had a red triangle. So you could tell they were, and they were headed to that camp there. They had better conditions. N next to our bag, barrack with a wire fence, which was not electrified. At night, we were able to sneak underneath and got to the other side of the fence where political interns were housed. In the morning, we were present for roll call and we stood in formation, and the German SS troops separated a bunch of us to be shipped out to Bremenhaven to work in the shipyard. Imagine, they were counting in the morning, we stood back out, and if they would finish the count, they would have said, hey, we have two people more today than they were yesterday. Who are they? Where did they come from? We would have been shot on sight. So anyway, when he came counting, to me, he stopped, he says, you're going to be shipped out to Bremenhaven to the shipyard. I worked there as a welder. One day the commandant guarded about 1,000 inmates and hauled them off into an abandoned ship, towed them to the open sea and detonated the ship with all the souls aboard. This time I escaped by going into hiding. They all are at the bottom of the sea. Then February 1945, the British advanced from the west. Again, our camp was liquidated and the remainders of it were transported again to Bergen-Belsen, the dead camp. This was my second time I had been here and was my seventh dead camp. But this time I had no intention of escaping because I could 
foresee that before long they would be liberated and sure enough our prayers were answered. And on April 15, 1945, a date I can never forget, the German guards and their superiors disappeared into the darkness of the night. By morning the gates were wide open and the British soldiers marched in shouting, we are here, you are free, you are free. It's hard to imagine how we felt. The British could not believe what they saw and the conditions of the inmates. They found 58,000 men and children of an 90% of them were Jews, all bones and walking skeletons. I was taken to the hospital with others. I was suffering from typhoid, tuberculosis, and was two months in the, in the hospital. My, my health improved and I was then transferred by the Swedish Red Cross to Sweden and I lived in Sweden until May 1949 when I located my aunt and uncle in the USA and was finally able to get to this wonderful country. And it was so wonderful to be greeted with open arms upon arrival in New York City, New York. I was the only one of my family who lived in Poland at the start of World War II to survive the horrors of the Holocaust and of the 100 young men that left Ulanov, only eight of us survived. So you can see I fought the angel of death in nine different death camps. I reached up to God, I thank you God for who had spared my life and enabled me to be here. And so I thank you my friends for <coughs> allowing me to share my experiences and tell you all of these horrible things and hope and pray things like this will never happen again, never again. In, in 2009, April 2009, I wrote a letter to Queen Elizabeth of England. Your Majesty, we are approaching April 15th, the 64th anniversary of my liberation in Bergen-Belsen, dead camp, where I was interned and finally liberated by the British troops. I have not forgotten the morning, the soldiers marched into the camp screaming, you are free, you are free, although I was very sick with typhoid, fever, diarrhea, etc. That morning will always remain with me until the day that I die. I want to express my gratitude and, and appreciation. And close, you will find my short autobiography. Please read it and pray that the atrocities of this kind will never happen again, never again. So I have a letter from Buckingham Palace from the Queen. The Queen wishes me to write and thank you for the letter which you have sent to Her Majesty and with which you enclose a copy of your autobiography and other papers. I have to explain to you that because of the enormous amount of correspondence received by the Queen, Her Majesty is unable to reply to you personally. The Queen, however, asked me to thank you for showing her a copy of your remarkable autobiography and testimonials from so many people. I am to tell you that Her Majesty warmly appreciated the sentiments you expressed in your letter and was both moved and touched that you should have written as you did. And that's Lady in Waiting. And of course, there are letters here from Opera. Of her trip, she went to Auschwitz, and you know she writes her feelings was in Auschwitz. <coughs> Anybody wants to read it? Yeah. Oprah Winfrey told 3,000 supporters of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum last week that she's still haunted by her trip earlier this year to the Auschwitz concentration camp. I still can even imagine what it was like to go through a concentration camp and come out alive and say, the talk show host said, at a Chicago fundraiser for the museum. I couldn't take it all in when I was there. I couldn't wrap my brain around it. Winfrey traveled to Poland in January for a two-part episode with scholar and Holocaust survivor Eli Weasel. She also selected Weisel's memoir, Night, for her book club. Those millions and millions and millions who did not survive want us to never forget the hopes they sacrificed on the killing fields. 
She said during the 15-minute speech at a lunchtime fundraiser for the Washington, D.C. Museums, the 11th annual luncheon is the museum's largest regularly scheduled fundraiser. A museum's spokesman said he did not know how much the event had raised. Last year, the museum had an operating budget of more than $66 million, nearly one-third of which is raised by private donations. Other speakers include Chicago Mayor Richard Daly, and high school student who survived Rwanda's genocide. All of us must help stop prejudice and hatred wherever we meet it, Daly said. Organizers say education about the Holocaust remains important today to help combat genocide. Each of us has a responsibility. We have a moral obligation to find a way to serve somebody other than ourselves, Winfrey said. When we learn, we teach, we give, we get. Martyr. Yeah. Can you take some questions? Pardon? Can you take some questions? Sure. Does anybody have any questions? Don't wait for another 10, 15 years. <laughs> and don't kid yourself. I have a young lady in the Huntington Lakes who is now 103 years old. Yeah. And she's full of pep. Wow. Like you. Have you ever read the book Devil's Arithmetic? Have you read what? Devil's Arithmetic. Devil's Arithmetic. Have you read the book Devil's Arithmetic? No. No, I did not. Who wrote it? Jane no, 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 thank you. I have a question. I read a book about the, the zookeeper from Warsaw. Yeah. And uh, they talked a lot about the underground yeah. in Warsaw. Right. Did you deal with any of that? There was a lot of people who, who were got moved no, by the No, I didn't deal, but we had in our camp, in Putin, a lot of uh, people from Warsaw Lodge came to our camp, yeah. You mentioned that you were in Sweden after the war. After the war, there was, uh, I heard that there was a Japanese consulate that got a lot of Jews out of there. From Sweden? From uh, from Poland. No, they were from Poland. Yeah. Yeah. No, no it was what, what was the then a doctor. They got a lot of Jews out from Hungary. Hungary. Yeah. When you came to the United States, what what did you do to set up a life for yourself and a profession? Okay, I came here in two weeks before Shavuos, 1949, and I came to my aunt and uncle who lived in Brooklyn, good old Brooklyn. So I stayed with them for about I stayed with them for three weeks. And then my aunt said, well, the fish is, starts to smell. Oh. <laughs> you know what that means, right? It's time for you to start going to work. So she found me a job in Manhattan. And they, well, I was uh, cutting, I was, what do you call it? I was, I was making earmuffs from fur, OK? So, but I was working in that factory there. The fur was flying all over, and I couldn't take it. So I came home, and I told my aunt, I'm not going to last longer here. I'm going to quit. And she says, and what are you going to do if you quit? I said, I'll go back to Sweden. She says, oh, no, you will not go back to Sweden. So sure enough, I quit. And about a week later, she found me another job, and they were assembling music boxes for stuff toys. You know, the wind-up, musical wind-ups. So I got a job there, and uh, I was working there for about six months, and then about a week before Thanksgiving, I went into the office, and I saw, told the boys there that I need $2 a week a race. I was getting $17 a week, 37 and a half cents an hour. That was the minimum wage, okay? 
So they asked me, why do you need a race? So I said, well, I'm, I told them a lie, of course. I told them I'm leaving my aunt's apart house and I'm going to rent my own apartment. So they said, well, all right, we'll talk to the foreman. We'll see what he has to say about you. So me and the foreman didn't get along. <laughs> Why? Because when I found a broken music box or something, the foreman says, put it aside. He'll collect them, he'll repair them. I was wild, you know. So I stole a musical movement, I took it home with me, took it apart, found out where the leg goes, and I was able to do my own repair. And they didn't like that. So on Wednesday, they called me into the office, and they said, well, Michael, we spoke to the foreman, you don't have a good health report. And we'll have to, we'll have to, well, no, tomorrow is Thanksgiving, I didn't know what Thanksgiving was anyway. <laughs> so he says, and Friday we are not working, and don't come in on Monday. <laughs> All right, Monday morning, I sleep a little late, my aunt knocks on the door, she says, Michael, you're late for work. I didn't answer, Michael, you're late for work. And then finally I told her, I'm not going to work. She says, what do you mean you're not going to work? They told me not to come in. So she picked up the phone, and she found out I was fired. <laughs> so she comes back and she says, Michael, did you know that you were fired? I said, what does fired mean? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't speak English. I was only six months in the country. So she says, well, you have no more job. What are you going to do? And don't tell me you're going to Sweden. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not going to Sweden. But anyway, while I was working there, there was a gentleman from Romania who was handing out the music boxes to the, he, he gave the music boxes for like, what do you call it, sub... Uh, subcontractor. Subcontractor, yeah. They were assembling the box for him and he would sell them to the soft toy people. They would wind up. While I was there, that Leon Margulis went around, he gave me his business card and he says, you know, Michael, one day, if you want to get together, we'll have a cup of coffee or something. Now here, now I needed him. So I called him up. His office was on Hotel Ashby on 47th Street and Broadway. So I called him up and I said, Leon, I have no more job. I'd like to talk to you. He says, well, come on over. I came over, talked to him. He says, you know what? You see this office here? I can give you the corner. I supply you all the musical works, sit and work. Whatever you produce, you produce. The only thing is, I cannot give you hourly wage, I'll give you piece work. I said, okay, how much will you give me? He said, I'll give you six cents a piece. Oh, yeah. I was working in that place, I was making 700 pieces a day. Wow. So six times seven, you don't have to be a genius. <laughs> I was making $42 a day. And he says you can work Saturdays, Sundays, here's the key, do what you want. Oh, nice. Then my uncle came from uh, Heidelberg, from the DP camp, Uncle Schmiel, and he needed a job. So I said, you know what, if you want, you can work with me. I'll give you peace work. <laughs> Uh, I'm a businessman. I was getting six cents. I said, I'll give you four cents. <laughs> Can't take advantage of your mishpuch. <laughs> so anyway, we were working together. And then while I was working there, I had no, my boss was not there, so I copied every address and every place where my boss was selling and where he was buying the stuff. <laughs> One day, he calls me into the office and he says, you know, Michael, you're making too much money. <laughs> so, uh, okay, then what are you gonna do? We said, well, I'll have to let you go. But what are you gonna do with my uncle? And he can work for me. So he let me go, I came back and I told my aunt that I was fired. I had no job. So, what are you going to do now? Don't tell me you go to Sweden. No, I'm going to Switzerland. 
to buy the music boxes, etc. So I had already saved up over four thousand dollars. I had already my own car, you know. So I went to Swi I went to Switzerland, but on the way I stopped off in Paris. I had an uncle in Paris, my aunt's husband, but my aunt was taken away by the Germans. So I stayed with my uncle for about ten days, and then one day I said to un uncle. Uh, I want to go to shul with you on Shabbos. He says, no, you don't want to go to shul. He says, next Shabbos is the Bastille day. There's going to be a parade over there. You go to Platz de Bastille. I said, no, I want to go to shul with you. He says, you're not going to get up so early. He gave me all cock and bull stories. <laughs> well, anyway, Saturday morning, I got up. I'm waiting in the kitchen for him to come out from the bedroom. He comes out, he says, oh, you really want to go to shul? I said, I told you I want to go to shul. But anyway, he lived on the third floor, so we walk down the steps, and we walk into the street, and he tells me that the chief rabbi of Paris said, if you buy a token on Friday, you're allowed to write this whole way on Shabbos. <laughs> he was, he was a very, very, what do you call it, religious man in the family, you know, so he, well anyway, so I went to shul with him, I had a good time, then I went to Switzerland, and I bought merchandise, I, I had a trip to the States, I opened up an office on the 20th Street, and between 5th and 6th Avenue in Manhattan, I had already engaged people to work, and I was working, and then I was going out to sell. He was selling a dollar a piece. I was selling for 95 cents a piece. He found out I was selling for 95. He was selling for 95. I was selling it for 90. It was going on. And then one day, a toy manufacturer from Porchester, New York, calls me up. He says, Michael, he says, why don't you come down to my office? I have some news for you. So I drove down to Porchester, New York. And he says to me, you see this music m movement? If you can give me a dozen samples, we are in business. The musical movement had a rod from the music box that will, if you put it into the stuffed toy, the head of the, of the teddy bear will, will go out. You know? <laughs> okay, well anyway, so I got him a dozen samples from Switzerland and I dropped him off. And a week later, he calls me up, he says, I got good news. What is it? Come on down. I come down. He gives me a written order for 10,000 pieces. I flew to Switzerland, and I bring more movement, and we assemble, and we were in business. And after that, I had already the raw movement. So I, I was starting to, uh, to invent finished products. I made a, a musical telephone, I made a little Persian tune, I made a little pia musical piano, and then I engaged salesmen, and I was selling to all the department stores and made all the houses. And here I am. And your family, Mr. Carter, your family? Pardon? And your family? I have my son who lives in Palm Beach. Is this Palm Beach? I didn't see it. <laughs> did, you, did I lie? No. no. Change, this drastic change, having been in all these camps, having escaped death, then coming here to the U.S., how did you adapt emotionally and spiritually? Did this continually haunt you? Because that's an emotional uh, scar. Doing what comes naturally. That's it. Go ahead. He's a when, at the camps, when they give you the tattoos on your arm? No, I don't have any, any number because I was only five or six hours in Auschwitz on the rail tracks, you know, and uh, they shipped me out, so they, I didn't get a number. Um, and then, um, why did you get that feeling when you wanted to kill yourself? Why did I what? Why did you want to kill yourself? Oh, by the way, but the work was so hard, you know. Imagine you get up every morning five five o'clock, and you have to stand in the street in the you know rain or shine, without food. You were tired. You had no you had no will of living anymore. 
didn't give you jackets to keep warm when it was freezing yeah, cold. To keep warm. You know what I did to keep warm? I took a, a cement paper bag, you know, and I cut out three holes, one for one for my right hand, a hole and I one for my left, and one over in the center for my head. I pulled it over and I wrapped it around with a rope, you know, to keep me warm. But it didn't help. The lice were growing. It was, yeah, it was horrible. Uh, which, uh, which camp was, was it when the, uh, when the British liberated? What camp was that? Bergen Belsen. Bergen Belsen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the Americans were coming in from the other side. The Americans were coming from the south. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I was in Stuttgart. This is south of Germany, and the Americans were coming from there, but they liquidated the camp, and they sent me to Bergen Belsen. Yeah, that was the 81st. Okay, very good. Yes. One last okay. question from the house, Mr. Amstrom. Uh, Stand up. Oh. You can see when you're... Michael, did you, did you always, you kept your belief in God the whole time, you had no doubts? We were not talking about God. In camp, nobody, you know, you, you were going like a you know, light sheep, you know. Day in and day out, night in, night out, and that's it. The only time when I came to Sweden, uh, we found out that in Stockholm, the rabbi in Stockholm was handing out twiddle and talus, so I got a talus with him. Or not a talus, just twiddle for him, man. Very much. But your Sweden is different. The Sweden is like this. You pay taxes. From the taxes, they take 1% or 1.5% and whatever church you belong to or whatever you are, you know, that money goes to the, to the pastor. And, it, and the rabbi was a chief rabbi in Stockholm. He was collecting all the money and he was distributing the money to the rabbi, to the synagogue in Helsingborg, in Malmö, in all the other places. That's how they kept the religion. Very interesting. Thank you so much. What's very interesting is that my father stayed in Malmö, Malmö. which now actually, at the time that he was 